Welcome to the Dali. Am I alone? Sorry. <laughs> this is one of those moments where I'm like, did I imagine? Did I imagine this was happening? Um, my name is Kimberly McQuarrie, and I'm the director of programming here at the Dali. And we're super excited um, to have you here to listen to Casey Sapp as a part of um, our continuing series. We're doing a quarterly series on um, tech. Uh, as you know, we think a lot about tech here, and in a minute I'm going to introduce the person who thinks the most about tech here at the Dali, my amazing colleague, um, Beth Harrison, who is our Digital Experiences Director. Um, but before um, I introduce her, I just wanted to let you know a few other things that are happening. I know that everybody is um, over planning and overbooked um, at this time of year. But just in case um, it could be of interest for you, I just wanted to share with you a couple of other events that we're going to um, have here at the museum. Tomorrow, um, although our physical location is sold out for the Coffee with the Curator lecture, which is gonna be given by my colleague, Dr. William Jeffett, you can catch him streaming on YouTube, or if you don't have a chance to catch him live, head over to our YouTube channel and listen to um, that lecture. It's the introductory lecture over our new exhibit on Impressionism and Dali. It's gonna be well worth um, the listen. And then on December 7th, um, you can join us back here for a very different interface. We're gonna be inviting um, the duo Oriya. Um, we have, she's an amazing vocalist. Her name is Ona, and um, she's accompanied by musician um, Alejandro from Colombia. And they're gonna be playing um, holiday music from Catalonia, Spain, and all, all over Latin America. It's gonna be a really amazing evening. Um, on December 13th, we have Art and Meditation, which is gonna focus on one of our Impressionist pieces. December 14th, our Poetry Open Mic. It's gonna be our first inaugural um, Open Mic Poetry Night, so be sure to join us. And then on December 15th, if you have not visited our Dali Alive 360 at the Dome, this might be your chance because we're gonna have a Dome After Dark event. And we're gonna have um, the Dome open, we're gonna have a DJ, we're gonna have some amazing um, cocktails, and we're gonna have an ugly sweater contest in case you need to break out that ugly sweater one more time um, this December. So with that said, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Beth Harrison, Digital Experiences Director, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. It's like a Monty Python movie. Like, <laughs> the, the Paris <laughs> Hello, can you hear me now? Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, at the museum, we regularly showcase programs on emerging technologies, and tonight's spotlight is on our speaker, KT Sapp, who has harnessed his entre entrepreneurial spirit by combining his interest in virtual reality with his passion for the oceans. Before KT takes the stage, let's delve into virtual reality, a transformative technology that immerses individuals in simulated environments. Its unique power lies in evoking a profound sense of presence and realism, offering a sensory experience beyond mere visuals. But to truly experience and appreciate the enchantment of VR, one must put on a headset and enter its realm. We discovered this firsthand in 2017 when we wanted to allow our visitors to step inside a Dali painting. In conjunction with our Disney and Dali exhibition, the museum ventured into the extraordinary with the creation of Dreams of Dali. This mesmerizing VR experience transcends traditional art boundaries, immersing visitors in Salvador Dali's iconic painting, Archaeological Reminiscence of Malay's Angelus. Say that five times, everybody. The magic unfolds as par participants journey into the surreal landscape of Dali's imagination, encountering a rich assortment of enigmatic objects and classic Dalinian symbols. And when you are within that world, it is hard to imagine that the painting on which it is based on is only 12 by 15 inches in size. 
Six years later, Dreams of Dali continues to captivate our guests, many of whom experience VR for the first time, offering a memorable passage into the limit, limitless creativity of this artistic genius. Dreams of Dali runs daily in our James Gallery. If you haven't had a chance to experience it, I invite you to do so. You will not be disappointed. But tonight we turn our focus to virtual reality, the deep blue sea, and our guest, speaker Casey Sapp. Casey is the Vice President of Strategy and Emerging Technologies at VideoArray, where he oversees new product development, monetization, and special unmanned systems initiatives. Before joining Video Ray, Casey founded Blue Ring Imaging, which focused on mixed reality and perception solutions for maritime unmanned systems and was acquired by Video Ray in 2023. And wait, there's more. Known for transforming intricate tech concepts into accessible and profitable solutions in growth technology companies, Casey is also inventor of the world's first 360-degree 3D underwater camera system. The first underwater 360-degree live stream premiered on Good Morning America and highest resolution underwater camera system in the world for MSG Sphere. Please welcome Casey to the stage. That was somewhat of a formal introduction. Uh, I think we took that right from LinkedIn. Uh, I, uh, it's good to be here. I'm, I'm not sure what, what brought um, each of you here, if it was the virtual reality, being in, uh, at the Dali Museum, um, just being a part of a very interesting speaker series. Uh, I am going to touch on a little bit about my background. I was asked to do that and to talk about virtual reality at a high level, and then how it drives empathy. Uh, that, that's really kind of the, the core of why I got into filmmaking before I ended up at, at VideoRay. I am, um, my first job was in St. Petersburg in 2008 for a bank. And if you remember what happened in 2008, it didn't, I didn't last there very long. <laughs> and uh, it was Bank of St. Petersburg at the time. And uh, I ended up hitting reset on my life and my goals and uh, moving overseas and traveling to a number of different cities and, and finding m my passion, my interest, what I was good at. Uh, there was, um, I found a, a term a number of years ago called uh, Ikigai, if you've, if you've heard of this. And it's the, um, the concept of combining what makes you alive and what gives you worth and, and mission and purpose. And so there's this uh, kind of magical combination, which is very hard to find. And, and not everyone ha has the benefit or the opportunity to do what, um, what you're good at, what you love, what the world needs, and what you get paid for. And that's the big one that took me a while. And, uh, and that for me is, is virtual reality, the ocean, uh, robotics, and, and, on, and essentially starting companies, starting, uh, starting technology companies, which is, was Blue Ring and is now Video Ray. Um, so what I want to do is just talk a little bit about how I got here, and then I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm not an expert at empathy. Uh, I'm not an expert at. I'm not even very empathetic to my friends, so I I, I can't even say that I'm I'm, I'm an expert in, in my relationships. But but I uh, I will touch on what some of the research has said, and then I'll let my some of my customers and clients speak for themselves uh, through a few videos, and then at the end after 20, 25 minutes, and uh, if there's any questions, I have uh, teed up a number of different stories and films which have been created since 2015 uh, with the likes of BBC, National Geographic, Google, 
uh, Michael Muller, if you've heard of him, and, uh, and others who have been trying, who have been putting their money where their mouth is and really taking their, their passions, um, partnering with me and others to put these stories together and, then, and to put them in a headset. And we know, we, we know that headsets are slow to adopt. A lot of people, um, when, the, when they think of headset, it's, it's uh, the first word that comes to mind is, is nauseating, sickness. Uh, I, I don't think these experiences are that, uh, but I, I think everyone's had, had a friend who put, put a headset on and had you try a roller coaster and then you couldn't get out of bed for a day. And uh, I know I have, and I, that's, that's always a concern, but uh, these are very, I think, compelling and, um, and moving stories uh, from, from some of the, the folks that I've worked with, and uh, I would love to share them. Uh, either that being today, or I can share them, sh share them later. So um, for those of you who are live streaming, Dolly Museum is one of the crown jewels of Tampa Bay and St. Pete. It's an amazing place. It's worth coming, coming here just to see this museum. And so I'm very lucky to be here. And um, so as Beth said, I've known Beth for a few years now, and she was, it was her idea for me to come and speak for a few minutes about, about immersive storytelling and filmmaking. I, I started a company it, it was related to marine robotics and, and ocean uh, 3D visualization or VR, and we were recently acquired two months ago. And, uh, and that company is based in Pennsylvania, and, and we are in the hub down the street. And, and so I, I'm in there every once in a while, and uh, now with the acquisition, we're going to be building a, a bigger engineering team here in, in St. Pete, which is exciting. Uh, as it's a really attractive place to live for, um, for SOCOM and CENTCOM, for, for USF, uh, for all the, the marine-based mapping that's happening out of here. And uh, it's just a great place to live. There's very few cities that are just so walkable and uh, not overly crowded and easy to live. And so I've been here three years. I've got, uh, I've got a son who's two and a half and I, I don't see myself going anywhere in, for the foreseeable future. So I, um, about 10 years ago, I put on a headset and uh, I was just, I was very moved and driven by where the future was going, how rapidly it was, um, it was happening. There's a saying that the, the future is here, it's just not distributed yet. And I felt that I had experienced something which the world was gonna experience over the next 10, 10 to 20 years. And, uh, and so I tried some of the first consumer virtual reality tech in 2014. And uh, I moved from a, an ed education technology company I was uh, working in. And I started uh, what, what, what is now Blue Ring. Um, it's taken a few iterations. And um, through just failing fast, I ended up becoming a filmmaker and never imagining myself to do that. I, uh, there, was, there was no content. There was headsets, but there was nothing to experience. And, and there were no cameras. And there was no language for storytelling. And no one knew how much things co cost. And, and so I immediately was thrown in in Hollywood. And uh, I became one of the first immersive filmmakers in 2000. 14 for uh, the span of six, seven years, and um, was pulled into all, a lot of the biggest projects, uh, especially on the live side, not, not as much the gaming side. And um, one of the, the biggest clients, which if maybe you all have heard of it now, is MSG Sphere, which it's a, project, it's a 360 dome, and, and James Dolan, uh, the, the billionaire who owns the Knicks, wanted to have a headset experience just without wearing a headset. So we created the, the largest, most unbelievably um, expansive IMAX screen I've ever seen. It's, I, think it's, um, <coughs> I think it's 100 times bigger than an IMAX screen, if you guys have seen any pictures. But there was no camera tech for it. <laughs> so in, in the process of building films and stories for, for 360 video in a, in a headset, I was also doing things such as uh, SeaWorld, Abu Dhabi, and MSG Sphere, and others, and building the tech, and 
helping understand how, how to shoot and process a thousand terabytes of data <laughs> and turn that into a single itty bitty file. And, uh, and so I, I just started going about creating cameras and, and solving problems. And uh, each of these, I, I put my reputation and, uh, and all my money on the line and hoping that they would work. And, and fortunately they did. And the cameras evolved and the, the clients evolved and the opportunities evolved. And, um, and over time, um, the, the more people got into the space, uh, but there was four or five years where I was the only one doing this. And, uh, and so I ended up just gaining a passion for building 360 cameras. And uh, I built pretty much every 360 camera that's out there um, up until about two years ago. And, uh, and built all kinds of prototypes. They were very niche, maybe one or two people used them. But through this, there was just learning and, and passion and, and seeing people fulfill their dreams, especially on the filmmaking side. And, uh, and that's what drove me. Uh, but ultimately, I didn't want to be in Hollywood. I was more interested in going back to technology and uh, being able to work from home. And, uh, but I traveled the world. I was able to, to create some really cool inventions, being, being a personal submarine. Uh, work with billionaires around the world, which was interesting, and uh, just given very ambitious goals and deadlines, and I had nothing to lose because I had nothing in my bank, and I and I was I was single, so that's not true anymore. But uh, but back then there was no, no further uh, place to go than down than where I was at. So I um, I ended up working for a ton of being in all kinds of film festivals, winning winning. Excuse me. <laughs> um, I'm told this will come back after a couple seconds. Here we go. And um, <clears throat> being in all kinds of film festivals, winning awards, helping people, uh, because I did not want to be a director um, or a, a filmmaker. I didn't want to make the story. I wanted to help, uh, help them execute it. And, and I liked the problem-solving aspect and uh, traveled all over the world, um, all the best dive places people paid for for me to go, which was incredible. And, uh, and through that, I started, uh, this is where kind of the origin of Blue Ring happened, was that I was asked by Good Morning America to do a, a underwater 360 live stream in the Caribbean and stream that to New York. And I said, and I, and I was, so I was putting this headset on and watching what was happening in real time, I was like, th there's definitely something here and may maybe it can get me back to, to where my, my dream and pursuit was around building a technology company. And ultimately that was um, flying ROVs, flying unmanned systems with a headset. So moving from tablets and, co and computers and screens to having everything synthetically generated in, in a headset. And a couple years ago that seemed all, not that all possible, and, and now that's becoming a, a dream. And um, there's there's new new terms. Uh, it, I just heard one from Palantir today. <clears throat> they call it immersive command and control, and and so other companies are now getting into the space. And and so I did this five six years ago, and uh, the tests went well. Some white papers were written. Started getting military contracts. Started seeing results. Uh, started getting more clients, and um, and through those contracts, we were able to uh, start connecting to more ROVs and unmanned systems, which ultimately ended up in the the Video Ray acquisition two months ago. And so, so Video Ray is is a, is a remotely operated vehicle company. They have a an ROV. There's a little yellow uh, 3D printed one. It's the size of a of a table. And it can go 3,000 meters deep. It can handle all kinds of payloads. And, and the goal is that there are a lot of harsh and, and dangerous environments for divers in the world, and we'd rather have robots doing them. But how does a robot perform like a human? What kind, how do they see? What kind of perception? What kind of tactile manipulation? Um, haptics? What, what needs to, to take place on the technological side to do what humans can do? 
And, and so that's my goal is, is working with Video Ray to implement technologies that uh, replace humans for anything from diffusing a mine to being in a nuclear reactor. And, um, and, they use, and they're being used for all different types of uh, environmental and, and commercial use cases. And, and so there was a graphic that I wrote a few years ago and I had an illustrator make it and uh, it was essentially moving from this little laptop to just a headset, and and that's what we um, essentially have have developed, and that was the technology that was acquired, and and I'm still working on that just now for for an ROV company, and this was more of my my interest in my space than than filmmaking, but filmmaking was a really interesting chapter of my life, which now I'm gonna uh, get back to, so. Uh, about 10 years ago, I, if you haven't seen this TED Talk from Chris Milk, a lot of people started in virtual reality and the origins of their careers came from this. And, and Chris Milk was a film director and, uh, and, and started to bring up and tie the concept together that, um, that empathy is, is, drives action and that virtual reality is, a, is an empathy uh, machine. He, that, that was his, his term. And uh, it was, and in you should hear the talk. Very short. I'm I'm, I'm not good at uh, at summarizing it more than that. But uh, through through that, I, I was actually quite intrigued and went down that went went down that path for a while. Obviously in Hollywood, and um, like I said, I'm not an expert at empathy, but through research, there are three there are a couple different types of empathy. There is uh, cognitive which is just understanding someone's side and their argument. I'm, I'm a little bit better at that one. There's emotional, which is actually feeling their pain and, and, and being in their shoes and, um, and you know, having that emotional connection. And then there's compassionate empathy, which is really driving action. So if you had a friend's relative die, if we had the, a real example here, tangible example, um, cognitive empathy would be, you know, kind of thinking through how they would be, be feeling and kind of understanding their situation and, th you know, thinking strategically about what decisions they're going to have to make and, 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 you know, on the more kind of statistical and, and, and data side, uh, pro processing uh, all, all that information. And then emotional is you know, feeling what that first person is feeling, remembering, remembering if you had a lost, uh, a loved one that you lost and, um, and, and sitting with them, obviously, and feeling that sorrow and, and pain. And then compassion would be to go and help them take action to uh, go do chores for them or take care of their kids um, and so forth. And, and the research generally has said that emotional empathy is, is undeniably um, impacted with immersive storytelling, and and that uh, there is no greater storytelling medium than VR to drive emotional empathy, and then cognitive empathy and compassionate empathy. Still a little bit ambiguous. Depends on who the white paper, um, who wrote it, and and kind of what what their um, kind of purpose and drivers are, but. I think if if you do if you if you go to Google and you type in some of the keywords, you'll find that emotional empathy is is un unquestionably a part of um, immersive storytelling. Being able to feel what someone else is feeling and and being in their situation, um, whether that's in the ocean or or you know being in someone who, someone's body who has a disability or being blind. There's a number of different experiences like this in the App Store which you can try. Uh, where they're trying to, you know, drive this point home uh, based on what the story is about. So what I'd like to do is uh, I'll let my I'll let two of my my friends and partners and customers um, speak for themselves. One is Erica Woosley out of uh, San Francisco, and uh, one one is um, Jeff Hester. But Jeff was a uh, Working, I can't remember actually what the Queen of the Mantis' real name is, but I'll uh, I'll show a video for both of them. And uh, essentially, I provided the camera system. 
help them uh, do the filmmaking, put the story together, and then through this story, they were able to um, achieve some of their goals. And Erica, she uh, has, if you go online to the Hydrus, H-Y-D-R-O-U-S, she's created a, a kit that you can buy for schools. And, and uh, th it's a VR headset that looks like a scuba mask and it has a lot of ocean content in it to help people understand um, some of the impacts of, of reef and, and coral bleaching and, um, and some of the other top topics. So unfortunately, I couldn't find this video anywhere else but Instagram. Meta, for some reason, decided to post it only here. Uh, and so I'm going to just press play. It's only about 30 seconds. Let's see. Is... Here we go. Dress is, I can take the ocean to everyone. So a big part about what my co-founders and I wanted to do with the Hydrus was to translate scientific discovery in our ocean into public understanding and action. You can see some healthy table coral. Our planet is a blue planet. It's about 75% ocean. And we are way more connected to it than I think most people realize. Can you see the fish on its belly? Having these wonderful MetaQuest 2s has allowed us to take people on these really high quality immersive experiences. It's amazing what this technology can do to not only connect you to places and things that are out of reach, but to people as well. It just creates a wonderful atmosphere of community and unity. So that's the first one. And then we have uh, Queen of the Mantas. Uh, this is, was done in, in Africa. So some of the camera systems and technology um, was, was taken to Mozambique. And, and through that, um, CNN decided to do a, a quick highlight. We are here at Pembani School. This is one of the schools that we run in marine conservation, one of the education programs of the Megafauna Marina. The Marine Megafauna Foundation teaches school children about the value of the ocean and how best to protect it. We are here to entertain the kids with VR experience. Realidade virtual, que vai vos pôr numa realidade immersiva. We will divide by two groups uh, because the VR, we've got only three, so it's not enough to get all of them at the same time. As we started to develop our education programs and, and tried to figure out how to break walls down and start to connect with kids, I immediately realized that we needed to use powerful visuals, you know, and being an underwater photographer and, and in, a, in an organization full of really talented underwater photographers and cinematographers, I thought surely this was the way to connect with kids, right? But I never really considered virtual reality. It's just not something that uh, I was ever very familiar with. And one of my PhD students uh, brought a headset along one year and he told me, you know, this is a new up and coming thing. And I thought, goggles? Well, that seems a bit odd. But the first time I put the goggles on my own head, I was blown away. And I was blown away because I was looking at footage that was shot on a dive that I was there for. And I thought to myself, this is the closest that I've ever felt to being in the moment when it was being filmed. I think one of the things that I feel really passionate about is democratizing the ocean for people. Because across the world, I appreciate that not everyone has access uh, to the ocean or ocean experiences or ocean education. The foundation's educators work with 10 schools in the region, so far reaching close to 4,000 children. Now in Mozambique, the education, it's grow more. And we've got a university, whole society, the political also. We're all involved on marine life. Whole country now, we, we've got different workshops every day talking about environmental, about the oceans, the 
the importance of to care about the the ocean animals. So that's two examples, and there's there's definitely others. Um, so on on a headset, for those of you who have time and interest to experience it, uh, I know it can be embarrassing having a headset on. And other people are looking at you or taking pictures. I promise no one will touch you. Uh, you we can set it up here on the on the stage, or you can sit down in a chair. Uh, there are a few stories that I've I've teed up, and uh, one is is Erica from the Meta video. That's that's Hydrus Immerse, and another one is Into the Now, made by Michael Muller, and uh, it's about his his experience and connection to undersea life, and just how it balances him and uh, gives him purpose and meaning. And uh, there's one from SeaWorld, which is, uh, is about eight minutes long and puts you into the tank of an orca. And they, uh, that, I, I hope you can imagine that probably didn't get as much distribution as they were thinking it would, because uh, you, when you put, your, put the headset on and you see these amazing creatures, the tank does feel quite small. <laughs> but, uh, but it was, um, but it, we spent, uh, good six months with them filming uh, these orcas and helping them uh, uh, kind of show the trainer and, and orca relationship that uh, was actually a real real bond that these animals had and and um, and through that it, it actually what became an installation in San Diego for a little while um, but SeaWorld's obviously moved away from orcas being the the primary uh, animal uh, that they want to market and then and then ecosphere and uh, and so just in in terms of how how we use this there is a, a button I'm not going to be able to tap into what everyone's seeing but there is a button called meta quest TV <clears throat> and you'll type you'll click on that button I'll try and tee it up as best that I can and uh, you'll go to what's called your, your media. And then in your media, you'll get to choose what you want to watch. And um, I can stay here for each film is probably five to eight minutes. And you can watch some or all of it. I, I think there's enough headsets for, for those interested. And, um, and yeah, that's it. That, that's, I think, the best explanation and the, and the best way to, to show everyone how important and powerful it is is to give you all an experience with the headset. And so I, hopefully I brought a few. And then I've also brought some of the cameras that were developed to create some of the content. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And, and then we can kind of have an informal breakout. Yes? Yeah, so playing water polo my whole life. Uh, I, I'm in a pool almost every day, and I've been a diver since I was 12 or 13 years old. Never saw that as a profession. Never saw that as the ability to make any money, and and so I went into banking of all of all things. Couldn't take a more opposite direction. And as I got older, obviously you realize you can take your passions and your mission and kind of mold that into what you want it to be. And if, if, you, if you get niche enough, there's some money to be made. And, and as I was exploring careers and, and moving from different industries and tech companies and got into Hollywood, there was no 360 cameras at all. And so we were making 360 cameras to stream NB, the NBA or stream surgeries to, to do different types of experiences which were hard to reach or rare uh, or expensive. Um, and there was just no content. And the New York Times called me and asked, would I film something underwater? And that nothing had been ever filmed underwater. And uh, I said yes. And I, 
The other film projects felt like work. And when I went under the ocean for this uh, trip in 2015 in uh, Catalina Island, it, off off San Diego in LA, it just it didn't didn't feel like I was working. It felt like like I couldn't believe someone was paying me to do this. And I was like, this this is it. Like I, I think I found it uh, at least for for this stage. And and I didn't see anyone planting their flag or trying to be an underwater VR specialist. No one had found that specificity uh, or or was a domain expert. I, there was no one in the world that I could call and say, how do you do this? And and so I just I knew that. I don't know if you know James Cameron's background, but he was a truck driver. And he put some a little bit of money together and made a film. And from that point on, he called himself a director and, and he and and he was just negotiating his his cost from then on then on out. <laughs> it doesn't take much in in Hollywood to call yourself a director or a producer or a, or, a, or a DP. Like you just need people to find what you're doing is valuable. And so I made one film, and I just said I'm the underwater expert, and uh, and sure enough, that didn't take much. And and as as the as Google and and um, links and videos and things started to kind of saturate, if someone typed in underwater VR, it still happens today. My my name comes up, and and so even though I've been out of the space for four years, probably on a monthly basis, I still get people asking questions like how do i do this you, you know what what's the what's the process how where do i get a camera like i have got this i got this film and 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 so filmmaking to me was um, an opportunity to inspire to expose to learn there was a mission there uh, the the business model is tough cuz you're only making money if you're traveling you're only making money if you're on on a project there's there's no saas business or subscription you, you get paid for the day and and that that was just difficult to to run a family and um, have any kind of stable life and some people like that and a lot of filmmakers are, are totally happy with that lifestyle but um, after a while that was something I I felt like was just not my, not my cup of tea but I did not want to let go of the ocean I did not want to let go of virtual reality and and, and just giving people experiences because when you it's really interesting when you Put, when you have a really good underwater film and you put a headset on someone, usually they hold their breath. Usually they, they, they don't, they, like they don't even realize it. it they, they don't even realize it, but they, it's like they feel like they're underwater. And that, those kind of experiences have just dr driven me for 10 years to keep giving people interactions and exposure um, to the ocean because most people don't dive and most people don't want to dive and most people find it too dangerous and but there's there's definitely something to learn just just being being there so um so james cameron builds all of his own ip and he does everything from scratch he doesn't he doesn't ask for help. <laughs> he, he, you know, part of what makes Avatar so interesting, and Titanic, and and Terminator, and you know, every movie that he's done, is uh, he's built everything from scratch. He's he's done it all on his own, and uh, done things which, you know, no one would have the money or the finances to do because it's just for a single film. So uh, he was not interested in 360. Uh, we, we had conversations a number of times um, with his team, but he wanted to get into what's called volumetric, which is the essentially developing, which is how Avatar 2 was filmed, if you guys have ever seen the tank. But there's hundreds of cameras in this tank in, down in New Zealand, and it, they're capturing it from all directions, and it's building a 3D model in real time of, of the person, of the object. And that's an extraordinarily expensive endeavor, which no one has ever done, or, and it's, it's hard to, to replicate. And uh, I did give some, some input there, and we did have um, a small job. It's, it's a little bit like Fight Club. When you work with J James Cameron, you're, you can't acknowledge that you, you know, you're in a fight club at all. You can't, you can't, 
it's been a couple of years now, so it's totally fine. I'm, I'm removed. I'm not even in the industry, so I, it, it, I've got nothing to lose. But he, um, he's very careful about who he works with and building IP. And um, yeah, 360 wasn't interesting to him, but developing these real photorealistic immersive worlds was. And that's, that's if, if you go online and see how Avatar 2 was filmed, it was filmed completely differently than any other film has ever been made. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so as someone who comes from the VR space, yeah. uh, you spoke about empathy when you opened up and the power of virtual reality to create empathy. In environmental education, we have a slightly different term for it. It's called environmental attitude. Mm. Yeah, I, I think my experience is that's a little bit where people are kind of fumbling in the dark a bit. And there's a there's a thesis and there's, you know, academic research done. We have the Ericas of the world who are actually, uh, you know, spending financial resources, building product and 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 testing it. But I it's I, I think from everything that I've seen over the last 10 years, it's very hard to quantify. And, and there's, there's really no, no way to, to give a mul multiplier to it or to say that it's X or Y percent better than a TV screen. It, you feel it. I mean, it, when you see someone's face and you see the expression, the emotion, you're like, there's something different here. But in terms of how you numerically put that on paper, I don't have a really good answer and I don't think anyone else does. And you'll find papers all over the spectrum coming with different results. It's undeniable that there's emotional empathy, but driving action, that's, that's still to be determined. And some films may be more than others. And I think some of the research has said it really, you know, depends on the person, depends on, on their situation, depends on, a number of different factors that you really can't control. But at some, and I know for me, I wouldn't be in this space if I hadn't experienced a film. So it drove me to a career. But whether you put that in front of 100 kids and that'll drive 99 kids to a career, I, I don't think anyone knows. Yeah. So Casey, um, if you do want people to um, you know, experience some of these uh, headsets, Oh, uh, okay. We got a hard stop. Yeah. So, so, uh, so there's four people. <laughs> I get to try. <laughs> so, yeah. But, uh, but it, I, I can set up times at the hub and yeah. You, yeah. How about we do that? And I'll just, I'll bring more headsets and then we can just, we can just have a whole VR day. Lauren runs, helps run the hub. She's in charge of operations there. She's a wizard. And uh, we can have a VR storytelling day. So. Let's do it, yeah. Yeah. There, so there are, there are a couple headsets that all have their own trade-offs. Uh, Meta has the most content. And it's the easiest to use. And it's still hard to use. <laughs> it like it's it's a different language even of pressing buttons and control and powering i mean everything's different so you everyone need if you're going to like own a headset you got to spend time getting used to how it works um there are others but i would say in terms of consumer virtual reality no one really comes close there's there's some that are better for aircraft simulators or you know really like high high resolution high fidelity types of um environmental you know recreations but the, they're thousands and thousands of dollars whereas this one you can buy on amazon for 300 so that's 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 meta's play is to to create something that's so 
mass scalable that everyone can have one and no one else can do that. Even Apple, they're only releasing like 5,000 headsets next year. Yeah. So everyone, thank you for coming. I'm, I'm glad you're interested and uh, happy to keep chatting. So. I'll be in Philadelphia.